Good afternoon. Hello, uh, I'm Chris Bishop. I'm a senior clinical research fellow in trauma echo and doing a PhD in the same at the Centre for Trauma Sciences uh, all the way from London. I'm also a lecturer in resuscitation science at the Institute of Pre-Hospital Care at London's uh, Air Ambulance HEMS service. I'm delighted to talk to you today about our trauma VA ECMO programme. So the learning outcomes of this session are to understand the pathophysiology of cardiogenic shock that develops in major trauma patients, to recognise the scope for mechanical circulatory support with ECMO to rescue patients from uh, the consequences of severe bleeding and shock, and to understand our clinical experience um, in our institution so far to date and what the unanswered questions for research are. Ah, so this is where we are uh, in Whitechapel at the Royal London Hospital Major Trauma Centre. It's a level one MTC, uh, part of the London Major Trauma System. We are one of four uh, receiving major trauma centres for the whole of uh, London and surrounding area. Home to London's air ambulance, as you can see. We have about 2,000 trauma team activations per year and approximately 300 to 350 of these are code reds. So these are patients who are, who are very severely badly injured. They are bleeding to death and require immediate uh, damage control intervention. So they need to go to the operating room or to the interventional radiology suites. Uh, we have an integrated academic centre for trauma sciences where I'm doing my PhD and a suite of clinical research goes on there, looking at things like acute traumatic coagulopathy, uh, TBI, organ dysfunction and protection after trauma, and uh, some social sciences research as well, looking at violence reduction. Unfortunately, um, Whitechapel does have a bit of a, a chequered history. Indeed, it's the, uh, it was the home, we think, to the uh, infamous uh, Jack the Ripper murderer, who unfortunately the police never caught in the hunch cartoon on the uh, right hand side, um, sort of uh, mocks the uh, police's uh, inability to, uh, to catch Jack. And this is unfortunately a, a scene that we're often faced with, uh, particularly over a, a weekend. We do see more trauma at this time of the year as well. Uh, so this is a this would be a patient who has come in with a penetrating injury and we unfortunately see a lot of these and major trauma care can offer certain things like damage control interventions, uh, blood transfusion, one to one to one uh, products and components, uh, resuscitative thoracotomy um, when things are in extremis. And if we look to the timing and modes of death and trauma hemorrhage, there has been um, a, a change. So patients. Um, we're getting more patients uh, to hospital alive thanks to uh, advances in pre-hospital care and damage control interventions and life-saving surgery and interventional radiology. Um, so around about um, sort of a, a very high percentage of patients still die uh, in that sort of um, before three hours stage from exsanguinating hemorrhage and they're exceptionally um, challenging. If you look um, sort of later on in their clinical course, so one day uh, to post 24 hours, uh, less exsanguination, but we see those patients who do get to uh, surgery and have their bleeding stop controls and their, their, um, their injuries fixed, they will go on to develop uh, multiple organ uh, dysfunction syndrome. And just to, to highlight, looking at these causes of death, so uh, in 2020, our data, so 66% of our early deaths were exsanguination, uncontrolled coagulopathy. So these patients who developed acute traumatic coagulopathy who just couldn't stop their bleeding in time. Uh, patients that had traumatic brain injury, so either as a, a direct um, insult or falls from heights, uh, assaults, those sorts of things, 52% um, of late deaths. And cardiovascular collapse, really importantly, is driving a lot of our later deaths. So that 24 hours uh, to 48 hours and up to one week uh, post-trauma. So we see this cardiogenic shock of trauma that develops as a consequence of uh, severe bleeding. And our current model of understanding, there's the organ dysfunction going on, but uh, this important acute traumatic coagulopathy. So when patients are severely injured, right from that point of injury, um, some very strange things uh, start uh, happening to uh, blood clotting and coagulation. So the patient um, has this uh, inability uh, to form clot, or it takes uh, a lot longer than it should do to start forming. That clot that forms is relatively... Um, relatively unstable and prone to break as a hyperfibrinolysis in those early stages and these patients become 
uh, coagulopathic if um, we're able to um, maintain hemostatic competence, so, so rescue their coagulopathy with blood component therapy, tranexamic acid, uh, et cetera. Um, in the later stages of their clinical course, they, they kind of switch their um, bleeding phenotype into one of a hypercoagulable state with uh, consequences of increased clotting tendency and forming deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary emboli, which can further drive um, organ dysfunction and complications during the ICU stay. And this uh, lethal triad, so if you, you go to a trauma conference, you read a paper about trauma, you often uh, see this. So the acidosis, hypothermia and coagulopathy, yes, uh, they're important, but there are probably some other players. If you think about the severely um, injured patient who receives a massive blood transfusion, um, they have their calcium collated and their serum calcium um, decreases to a critical level. A patient who has a very severe burden of injury and has a lot of tissue injury, they'll um, be releasing uh, potassium into their bloodstream and um, they'll be hyperkalemic. And hypocalcemia and hyperkalemia is essentially a, a trauma-induced cardioplegia, which we'll know will exacerbate cardiac function, uh, cardiac dysfunction, I should say, um, with sort of acidosis, hypothermia and coagulopathy that we're seeing in these trauma patients. And uh, cardiac dysfunction, it's real, it develops cardiogenic shock, is a real um, phenomenon. So this, these are uh, data taken from our ICU, um, charting the patient um, from the moment they hit the ICU to uh, sort of 48, um, 48 hours. And we can see um, patients who are initially resuscitated, but take uh, sort of a dive in their physiology, if you like. So we see reductions in their cardiac output, stroke volume, they... Uh, are acting like a, a typical cardiogenic shock patient. So their, their systemic vascular resistance uh, index uh, goes up. They have a drop in their mean arterial pressure and requiring the uh, addition of one and often more um, inopressor agents to maintain organ uh, perfusion and oxygen delivery. And mortality is significantly increased in patients that have uh, some cardiovascular um, dysfunction as part of their clinical course. So we see the clinically, we've also um, modelled this um, experimentally. So some, um, some uh, basic science work that we did at the Centre for Trauma Sciences, looking at cardiac dysfunction uh, following uh, traumatic uh, hemorrhage in a mouse model. So we see when we uh, deliberately injure these animals, we see echocardiographically, they have regional wall motion abnormalities. They even have valve lesions. We see a reduction in their stroke volume and measured cardiac output. They're, they have worse in shock status, they have markers of myocardial injury, they have released troponins and HFAB, which is a human fatty acid uh, binding protein, so markers of uh, myocardial injury, cell death, reductions in the cardiac output and stroke volume. And this uh, nice work that, that came out of uh, Maryland um, looked at this cardiac physiology that underpins these patients uh, dying of severe bleeding. And what we see clinically that I've just shown you in our ICU, what our uh, experimental work is, is backed up by this. So we see, we have to remember that trauma patients are relatively young with good physiology up until their insult at least, and they're able to uh, compensate their injuries very well. But once we see um, the blood loss uh, exceeding 50% uh, of their circulating volume, we see big drops in mean arterial pressure stroke volume, the left ventricular ejection fraction. And very importantly, uh, coronary um, artery perfusion pressure and coronary flow. And there's a, there's a very good correlation between that very big drop in mean arterial pressure we see and coronary perfusion. So that is these patients who are dying from major trauma hemorrhage are dying from uh, poor coronary perfusion and, and therefore uh, myocardial uh, essentially a large myocardial infarction. Um, so just to put this all into perspective, so we see initial hemodynamic instability due to preload failure. So the patient who's potentially been stabbed or shot has lost a lot of their circulating volume that they've exsanguinated. Coronary flow is relatively well preserved until you get this critical map of around 20 milliliters of mercury and any further reductions in that power this massive drop in coronary flow, severe kind of ischemia, and cardiac performance, as I've demonstrated to you. And looking electrically 
at this uh, these patient uh, electrocardiograms, uh, they often start off with a sinus tachycardia. As their myocardium becomes more hypoxic, we see uh, bradycardia. Uh, we might see some uh, broadening of complexes and eventually uh, asystole, which sadly uh, represents the patient who is unsalvageable. So therefore, future resuscitative therapies need to look at coronary flow and perfusion to try to prevent myocardial failure and death and to rescue these bleeding trauma patients. And this model has been proposed to an endovascular extracorporeal resuscitation paradigm. So in severe non-compressible torso hemorrhage, what do we have in our toolbox? Well, if the patient has had a pre-hospital cardiac arrest, we can um, do a pre-hospital thoracotomy. We can open the chest, uh, clamp the aorta, start doing some cardiac compressions and look for uh, reversible causes. So treating hypoxia, relieving tension pneumothoraces and evacuating uh, cardiac tamponades. If they have a ROS, fantastic. Um, but all we kind of can offer is conventional um, therapy at the moment. So we might end up with somebody who's arrested, but is in cardiogenic shock. We can put them on venoarterial ECMO. If they haven't arrested, we've got another tool, uh, Reboa, so resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. So we percutaneous access to the arterial system and we uh, blow up a balloon in their um, sort of uh, aorta. And if we blow up that proximal to the aortic arch, will stop bleeding, but will also increase coronary perfusion. And some new players um, on the block We've got things like sem so selective aortic arch perfusion. So uh, as perfusionists, you'll be uh, familiar with this. So this is basically uh, um, selective cerebral perfusion, but given another name and translated uh, to the resuscitative trauma world. And further down the line, we might see EPR, so emergency preservation and resuscitation. So getting the patient down to 10 degrees, um, which buys an operating surgeon um, time up to one to two hours to repair their injuries. And then we'll rewarm the patient with uh, standard uh, OR cardiac pulmonary bypass, as we know and love. And this is just some, uh, some pictures. So on the uh, left-hand side, we've got a, uh, a what we call a zone one Reboa. So the uh, balloon blown up in the, um, in the proximal to the uh, aortic arch. So it's going to stop um, any bleeding sort of uh, further down from the balloon. So that's going to preferentially um, send uh, oxygenated blood um, to the brain and down the coronary circulation. With SAP, uh, so that's essentially a, a passive technique, Reboa, but with SAP, um, it's essentially Reboa, but with some antegrade flow, and we can use different vehicles, so uh, things like whole blood, uh, fresh whole blood, uh, blood components, um, saline, and looking um, to the future, perhaps artificial oxygen carriers, and then uh, potentially uh, VA ECMO as well on the, um, the right-hand side there. This is, uh, I think, any perfusion conference, this uh, often gets wheeled out when we start talking about ECMO, but it's important to see kind of where we came from. So this was uh, J. Norrell's Hill's uh, report in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine around about 50 years ago. We we're celebrating the uh, first ECLS run. And indeed, in an adult patient, it was done in a trauma patient. So ECMO in context of, of the, the severely injured um, trauma patient. So the modality of ECMO depends on the underlying disease process, and I'm talking to you about cardiogenic shock, so we're probably going to be using uh, the VA, the venal arterial cardiac support. Remember, ECMO is not a definitive treatment per se. It facilitates everything but achieves nothing. It is just going to buy us time, isn't it? So to buy us time and hopefully um, to recovery or buy us time to make a decision about what to do next potentially uh, or to more durable, durable mechanical circulatory support or transplantation. And we have to remember that the reversibility or perceived reversibility of this acute trauma and further um, the ability to survive further surgery is an important um, consideration when we're selecting trauma patients for the VA ECMA. And this is just a nice uh, circuit diagram of it. So um, even in uh, trauma patients going for the percutaneous um, peripheral option, so draining from the, uh, the right heart via the femoral vein, pumping through the membrane oxygenator, returning retrograde into the art arterial tree right via the common femoral artery. Um, and just to remind you of some of the intricacies of the, uh, the ECMO physiology, so we, as well as cardiac support, will have um, oxygenation and CO2 removal, just as with VV uh, ECMO, 
and the, the big advantage is we're going to increase fusion pressure, give the patient a physiological blood pressure and near normal oxygen um, delivery to try to ameliorate that tissue hypoxia. We will have some flow competition, which can introduce uh, certain problems. Um, we can increase the uh, LV afterload uh, distension. Therefore, it's very important to make sure the, um, the uh, LV is emptying and facilitating uh, LV ejection is really important. Problems with limb ischemia and that differential oxygenation or differential hypoxia or the Harlequin syndrome, as we like to call it colloquially sometimes. And this is the setups we use in our institution, probably not uh, similar to uh, you guys in the States. Um, so our kind of uh, retrieval platform, our cardio help system and our uh, central electronics uh, system for uh, patients who are in hospital who might need a circuit chain. And uh, we'll usually we'll go for the percutaneous option, um, but our Sometimes we, we might uh, opt for a, a sort of hybrid technique and our, our colleagues in France are quite fond of this. So, uh, so it's not quite sounding, a, not, quite, um, not quite a cut down, but somewhere in between you know, opening the skin and sort of cannulating under direct vision. Um, the injured trauma patient um, in cardiogenic shock also presents some uh, interesting metabolic challenges to us as well. So they could be very severely acidotic and hyperkalemic, which is refractory uh, to conventional medical therapy. So your nursing staff having to give exceptionally uh, sort of high doses of things like sodium bicarbonate and um, sort of potassium lowering uh, insulin and plugging the patient into uh, sort of an inline continuous renal replacement therapy device could um, sort of have facilitate this hemodynamic metabolic rescue, as I like to call it. So looking to the sort of possible benefits of, of ECMO to these patients, well, we're going to optimise their physiology, potentially improving their flow to the microcirculation, because that is a really important thing that we're uh, maintaining a sort of mitochondrial integrity will ameliorate ischemia reperfusion injury and the, the precise control of uh, oxygenation is a, a, a very much a hot topic in uh, critical care, not just in trauma. Um, they'll have a low flow state, but uh, as we uh, improve um, tissue perfusion, we'll mitigate some of those uh, inflammatory components as well. And one thing that we are able to do when we've got the patient on VA ECMO is to dial down um, those uh, those doses of ionic presses because we're having a patient in cardiogenic shock whose heart is really struggling. And what we're we're asking it to do with inotropes is work harder um, at the expense of myocardial um, more myocardial oxygen consumption and uh, potentially more ischemia and, and infarction, which is clearly um, going to uh, sort of make the uh, cardiac dysfunction um, spiral even more. And of course, we want to avoid this. So this is the, the bridge to nowhere. So placing a patient on mechanical support, uh, but they don't have an exit strategy. So there's no transplant option available. There's no durable MCS and they're not showing signs of organ recovery. But uh, hopefully these situations are very few and far between as we get better at case selection. And um, what we're going to do when we've got the patient on VA ECMO, so standard um, critical care, so ideally looking for um, recovery of the myocardium with echocardiography, pulmonary artery catheter measurements, looking at the ECG, the arterial line, looking for um, that increased pulsatility as a marker of more left ventricular ejection and therefore um, cardiac recovery. Um, some units are using sublingual uh, microcirculation measurements and NIRS, near infrared spectroscopy to um, sort of look at uh, perfusion in, in more detail, more depth. Of course, our clinical assessments are important as well. So lightening the sedation and see the patients uh, waking up. They, uh, they're good from a neuro point of view, uh, the capillary refill time, um, and looking at those warm, cold lines in the limbs and urine, urine output and biochemistry, what's their lactate base excess uh, trends? Are they clearing their lactate? Is their liver working? All those sorts of very important things that, that can't be uh, overlooked in these patients. Uh, so if we have a look at some of the, um, the, the kind of the, the, the data, what does the data say? Well, generally um, there's been a, a quite a large increase in the use of extracorporeal life support in trauma. And I think the big signal is mostly for VV. So these are patients who develop 
hypoxemic respiratory failure, so acute respiratory distress syndrome, they have pulmonary contusion, pulmonary hemorrhage. Um, survival is pretty good, so in, in general, looking at the ALSO registry, uh, around about 60% survival for, for all comers who um, receive um, ECMO for trauma. And this is uh, some sort of a further uh, dive into the data. Most of these patients so, uh, sort of uh, have thoracic injury um, supported with VV ECMO due to um, ARDS and hypoxemic respiratory failure. Um, and let's let's have a look at some of these um, these outcomes. So trauma, ECMO, total cohort, uh, survival to discharge, just over 60 percent. Um, very good, actually, in the respiratory ECMO cohort, 63 percent, which which uh, is almost uh, identical to patients who have uh, non uh, traumatic lung injury. Uh, and even for cardiac support and EC ECPR, pretty reasonable as well. So 50% uh, um, sort of uh, being liberated from um, ECMO and going home. And even ECPR, so these are the absolute heart sink, the worst patients, um, you know, 25% survival, which is, uh, uh, you know, otherwise they, they, would, they would definitely be dead, these patients. And this is uh, a series from Australia, so Amos and colleagues, and they had a, a look at at the data and uh, similar things and so most uh, almost 75 um, percent uh, traumatic lung injury um, ARDS um, a smattering of cardiac support and ECPR and very very similar um, outcomes um, uh, compared to the ELSO registry and even in patients who are the most severely injured so with a very high uh, ISS uh, injury severity scores um, who are who are dying in front of you? Who are have florid cardiogenic shock, or are in the emergency room um, with cardiac arrest and having um, eCPR? We can see in this uh, small case series of um, nine, this is the most seriously injured cohort I've found. Um, we can still have a survival around uh, thirty three percent, so it's pretty good. Um, so transforming trauma is our. Um, clinical and research program to um, try to save more of these um, bleeding patients. And we know despite advances in pre-hospital care, we've got a good network of air ambulances and enhanced care teams providing uh, open heart surgery, blood transfusion, uh, emergency anesthesia at the roadside. Still, uh, and even with targeted hemostatic resuscitation, early damage control, one in four of these patients still don't make it, okay? They don't survive. And as I said, major driver of this is cardiovascular dysfunction. So exsanguinating hemorrhage, ischemia, reperfusion injury, and the inflammation of trauma driving this multiple organ dysfunction syndrome and death. There is no drug that exists for cardio protection and trauma yet. However, we are looking at study of an agent and VA ECMO can provide um, organ support to buy time for myocardial recovery and to rescue refractory uh, sort of hemodynamic and metabolic consequences of trauma. So this is our rewire study. So this is one of our studies at C4TS, so rescue of regadenoson. So severely injured bleeding patients are given this uh, adenosine agonist to improve coronary artery perfusion, myocardial blood flow. Uh, preserve um, sort of myocardial integrity. It does have anti-inflammatory properties, so we're we're hoping to see that this is going to help some of our severely shocked patients. And looking to what we're doing, so um, to in order to sort of summon a team and discuss the patient, we have a, a shock call, a bit like um, sort of with medical cardiogenic shock. So code red trauma patients, if they've had cardiac or lung injury, direct uh, blunt trauma they've had a thoracotomy or a BOA, they're so they've been resuscitated. And very importantly is um, to note that the, their bleeding has been controlled, but they are showing evidence of cardi uh, cardiac dysfunction, spiraling, worsening cardiogenic shock. So a, a shock call we put out and the patient will be um, discussed and a decision will be made whether to uh, mobilize the uh, ECMO team and put the patient on or watch and wait or a definite no. Um, so this is our first uh, so first case um, of a transformed trauma ECMO. So this was a 14 year old boy who was deliberately um, hit and, and uh, run over with a multitude of injuries, as you can see. So diffuse axonal injury, a subarachnoid hemorrhage and extradural hemorrhage as well. Severe lung and heart injury, so bilateral pneumothoraces and hemopneumothorax. Uh, severe pulmonary contusions, 
um, some cardiac contusions as well with evidence of frank cardiac dysfunction. He was very, very difficult to uh, ventilate, very uh, sort of needing uh, sort of high FIO2s, high inflation pressures and deteriorating cardiac dysfunction um, despite uh, sort of high dose iron oppressors. Uh, so he has a uh, code red transfusion, damage control surgery, and we um, put him on uh, VA ECMO in the OR. He had quite a complicated run, but he did do well, uh, requiring VA ECMO, then a transition to VAV, then oxy -RVAD. He comes off at 37 days and is discharged around day 62. He came back to clinic um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually. He's doing really very well and uh, sort of back to college and looking forward to living a normal life. And this is kind of his transition from his uh, to his uh, mechanical circulatory support journey, if you like. And this is a chest radiograph of him with his uh, oxy RVAD uh, cannula. So you can see the ProTech duo cannula in there, uh, tip of which they're uh, pointing towards his pulmonary artery. And we want to get better at trying to identify these uh, big sick code red trauma patients. So we um, are using PA catheters now, which is a useful guide uh, to uh, help uh, clinicians uh, with their resuscitation. Because we have to realise that the patient may have cardiogenic shock, but there might, might be elements of hypovolemic and vasoplegic, vasoplegic shock as well. So it will help us to differentiate that and to guide our medical therapy. And indeed, it has helped our clinicians um, with the terms of cardiac index and cardiac output to select these patients from for uh, VA ECMO. So where are we currently with our uh, ECMO programme? Well, we're operating in a bit of an evidence-free zone. Um, uh, so the scant evidence base and a history and a timeline of disease process and the information we get is quite difficult and dynamic. So we, for this first case, we initially had a, we were told we had a low flow time of around 30 minutes, but it was actually two minutes and the Chinese whispers and the misinformation um, almost uh, led to us not putting him on and he, he certainly would have died. So that that's, can be quite challenging. We've got limited experience of hemodynamic support in trauma patients. Most of what we know is uh, VV and our normal PA patient is older. They have diabetes, severe coronary artery disease, but it might be somebody who's got severe decompensated heart failure or a new diagnosis of myocarditis. So you know, these really are a sort of a new survivors to admission that we're working out what to do with. And we've got this fine balance between minimizing circuit thrombosis and uh, optimizing therapy. And of course the systemic bleeding that we're familiar with and uh, chive blockage of trauma, trauma induced chive blockage as well. And so understanding the nuances of uh, ECMO therapy is going to enable clinicians to anticipate and mitigate these complications early on. And of course, thinking about our exit strategy as soon as possible. So in summary, major trauma hemorrhage uh, leads to downstream cardiac respiratory or combined cardio respiratory failure, refractory to conventional management. Uh, however, ECMO can be a very uh, useful rescue therapy for us, either in the emergency room, um, post damage control surgery and control of bleeding, or the ICE phase of trauma care, so where the patient develops cardiogenic shock, um, sort of from three from day three to day seven. It's it's a halo procedure. We must re remember that. So it's high acuity, low occurrence, like with trauma reboa, like with uh, resuscitative thoracotomy lots of risks and, and complications, but high risk, yet high reward. Optimal case selection, a timing of support, weaning strategies are how we get these patients off, how we identify their myocardial recovery. Uh, prognosticating, prognostication and this interplay between uh, extracorporeal life support and traumatic coagulopathy are yet to be fully understood. Thank you very much for uh, coming and listening to my talk and hear about the London experience. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it and hope you have a, an enjoyable uh, rest of the conference. Here's my uh, contact details. If you wanted to uh, get in touch, ask some questions, please do. There's my uh, email address, my institution and my Twitter handle. And if we have time, I'd like to uh, offer the floor up for questions.
Uh, thanks, David. So what would you say is your greatest challenge to get to this point of the trauma aspect of the programme? Lots of challenges. So our, our ECMO service is not co-located in the major trauma centre. So they are at the cardiothoracic units uh, a few miles down the road. Uh, so that's one kind of logistics and, and training um, sort of uh, non-cardiac surgeons, non-intensivists, emergency physicians um, to um, to to Kenya and the winning the hearts and the minds of the uh, of the nursing staff. I think it's really important. And just before we get kicked out, uh, the last. Um, uh, Yes, we have. Uh, we do suspend uh, anticoagulation uh, with heparin for two to three days, and we've done well there. Have you not yet? We haven't done a Reboa and ECMO and trauma, but we are probably going to have a patient who has had a Reboa but then requires um, ECMO. Uh, not can kind of, please uh, send me some uh, questions on social media and uh, LinkedIn, etc. And I'd be delighted to uh, talk to you more about this really exciting area.